On this edition of Manned Space, we fly to the moon with the crew of Apollo 8 and consider NASA's decision to send them on their journey. 10, 9, we have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We have commit. We have, we have liftoff. On the morning of December 21st, 1968, the crew of Apollo 8, Frank Borman, James Lovell, and William Anders, lifted off from the Kennedy Space Center aboard a Saturn V rocket for a rendezvous with the moon. The three men were the first to fly aboard the giant Saturn V launch vehicle, and if all went as planned, they would become the first humans to fly into deep space and orbit another heavenly body. As originally conceived, Apollo 8 was to be an unmanned flight, but following the success of the unmanned flight of Apollo 6 and the manned flight of Apollo 7, the decision was made to fly Apollo 8 as a crewed mission. The plan was for the crew of Apollo 8 to test in Earth orbit the lunar module, the vehicle designed to land on the moon. It soon became clear, however, that the lunar module would not be ready to fly within the time frame necessary to meet the launch date of Apollo 8. After a launch pad fire in January of 1967 took the lives of the crew of Apollo 1, a journey to the moon seemed as unlikely as ever. In the wake of the fire, NASA Administrator James Webb replaced Apollo Spacecraft Program Office Head Joseph Shea with George Lowe, who had been serving as Deputy Director of the Manned Spacecraft Center. Lowe knew that without a lunar module ready to go, the mission objectives of Apollo 8 had to change. In August of 1968, Lowe proposed to NASA managers that instead of a repeat of an Earth orbital shakedown flight of the Apollo Command Module, the Apollo 8 crew could fly to and orbit the moon during which lunar landing procedures could be tested. NASA Administrator Webb took some convincing, but with the full support of his agency, he authorized the mission of Apollo 8. George Lowe's bold decision to transform Apollo 8 into a lunar mission was instrumental in the United States beating the Soviet Union to the moon. Now nearly two hours since their launch, the crew of Apollo 8 was ready to leave Earth orbit and head to the moon. Apollo 8, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. Apollo 8, you are go for TLI. Over. Roger, understand. We're go for TLI. Apollo 8, coming up on 20 seconds to ignition. Mark it, and you're looking very good. Roger. Ignition. Roger, ignition. Apollo 8, Houston, you're looking good. Apollo 8, Houston, trajectory and guidance look good. Over. Roger, Apollo 8, good here. Apollo 8, Houston, you're looking good here, right down the center line. Roger, Apollo 8. Okay, we got Seco right on the money. Roger, understand Seco. At nearly 3 hours and 21 minutes ground elapsed time, the crew of Apollo 8 separated their command service module from the second stage of the Saturn V launch vehicle and watched as it drifted away. They also observed the Earth getting ever smaller in their window. They were now well on their way to the moon. As the crew of Apollo 8 continued on their outbound passage to the moon, a global audience was unaware that Commander Frank Borman had fallen ill on the spacecraft. Borman had been throwing up and was unable to hold down food. At first, he would not allow his crewmates to report the sickness to mission control. But Lovell and Anders grew increasingly concerned with Borman's condition and convinced Borman to report the news to NASA flight surgeon Dr. Charles Berry. Berry was concerned that Borman had caught a bug and would pass it on to his crewmates. He recommended the mission be canceled. When news of the recommendation reached Borman, he was outraged. He reported back to Mission Control that his condition was improving. In fact, it was improving, and soon the illness passed. Borman had likely suffered from a severe case of motion sickness. Then, at approximately 31 hours 20 minutes ground elapsed time, the crew of Apollo 8 took to television, and Borman, now feeling better, described what the crew was seeing. Transmission is coming to you approximately halfway between the moon and the Earth. We've been uh, 31 hours, about 20 minutes into the flight. We have about uh, less than 40 hours left to go to the moon. Showing you the Earth, it's a beautiful, beautiful view. 
with uh, predominantly blue background and uh, just huge covers of uh, white clouds, particularly one very strong vortex up near the Terminator. Very, very beautiful. Then, when Apollo 8 was approximately 200,000 nautical miles from Earth, Jim Lovell described the view. What you're seeing is the Western Hemisphere, looking at the top is the North Pole, in the center is South America, all the way down to Cape Horn. For colors, waters are all a royal blue, clouds are uh, bright white, the land areas are generally a brownish to light brown in texture. At 64 hours, 22 minutes, ground elapsed time, the Apollo 8 spacecraft was only 12,761 nautical miles from the moon. The crew was traveling at a velocity of nearly 4,300 feet per second. At that rate, they would reach the moon in about four and a half hours. Up to this point, despite their close proximity to the moon, the crew of Apollo 8 had yet to see it. That would soon change, however. At 69 hours, 8 minutes, ground elapsed time, the crew would fire the service propulsion system to slow the spacecraft and enter lunar orbit. But first, at nearly 69 hours ground elapsed time, the crew would slip behind the moon and while communication with Houston was lost, they would become the first humans to see the dark side of the moon. 34 minutes after passing onto the dark side of the moon, Houston re-established communication with Apollo 8. Aboard the spacecraft, Jim Lovell radio to advise that the lunar orbit insertion burn had been a success. He told mission controllers that the burn was complete and that the spacecraft was now in an elliptical orbit around the moon. The next 12 hours would be taken up photographing both the near and far sides of the moon as well as potential landing sites for future Apollo missions. The crew captured over 870 millimeter still photos. On the crew's fourth orbit around the moon, Bill Anders captured this image. Dubbed Earthrise, it is perhaps the most iconic photograph of the 20th century. At 85 hours, 43 minutes, ground elapsed time on Christmas Eve, during a television transmission from their spacecraft, the crew of Apollo 8 sent greetings from the moon to the people back on Earth. We are now approaching uh, lunar sunrise, and uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament. And divided the waters which were under the firmament, the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning was the second day. God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place. And let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters called these seas, God saw that it was good. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. It's estimated that one billion people in 64 countries heard or viewed the live message. Delayed broadcast reached an additional 30 countries later that same day. After nearly 20 hours since entering lunar orbit and after completing almost 10 orbits around the moon, the crew readied the spacecraft for trans-Earth injection, the maneuver that would free them from the moon and set them on a course back home. Apollo 8, Apollo 8, this is Houston. Three minutes, LOS, all systems are go. Over. Roger, thank you, Houston, Apollo 8. All systems are go, Apollo 8. Thank you. And at 88 hours, 51 minutes, we show loss of signal with the spacecraft. Our next communications with Apollo 8 should come in about 37 minutes. 
Uh, we are now about 28 minutes prior to our trans-Earth injection maneuver. When Apollo 8 re-emerged from the far side of the moon, Jim Lovell radioed Houston with the news that they were now homeward bound. During their trip home, the crew performed two additional television transmissions, bringing to six the total number performed during the mission. On Christmas Day, they enjoyed a surprise from Director of Flight Crew Operations and their boss, Deke Slayton. In the food locker was a real turkey dinner with stuffing, along with three miniature bottles of brandy that Slayton had provided. While the crew enjoyed the dinner, Commander Borman forbade the crew from drinking the brandy lest they lose their edge in preparation for re-entry. 146 hours and 46 minutes after launch, the crew of Apollo 8 re-entered Earth's atmosphere at 400,000 feet, traveling at a velocity of over 36,200 feet per second. The ionization of the spacecraft caused by the re-entry was bright enough to be photographed from a nearby aircraft. The spacecraft's parachutes deployed and the crew splashed down in the Pacific Ocean a mere 2.6 miles from the recovery ship USS Yorktown. The three men were ferried aboard the vessel and after addressing the crew of the Yorktown, they settled in for a celebratory meal. The success of the flight of Apollo 8 cleared the way for the lunar landing of Apollo 11 just eight months later. As for the crew of Apollo 8, for Frank Borman, Apollo 8 was his second and final spaceflight. After retiring from NASA and the United States Air Force in 1970, Borman joined Eastern Airlines where he eventually became chairman and CEO, guiding the airline through the four most profitable years of its history. For Bill Anders, Apollo 8 would prove to be his only spaceflight. Like Borman, Anders also pursued a career in business ultimately serving as CEO to General Dynamics. Jim Lovell remained at NASA and was named commander of Apollo 13, the ill-fated mission that never made it to the lunar surface. After an explosion aboard Apollo 13's command service module rendered it powerless, the crew took refuge inside their lunar module and eventually returned home safely. Without the lunar module, the crew likely would have perished. The Apollo 13 mission was a reminder of the dangers associated with manned spaceflight. It also helped to underscore just how risky the flight of Apollo 8 was. It was only the second manned flight of the Apollo Command Service Module, and it was the only mission to fly to the moon without a lunar module. Had the events of Apollo 13 taken place aboard Apollo 8, the outcome surely would have been different. For their role in the bold and daring flight of Apollo 8, the crew were named as Time Magazine's Men of the Year for 1968. Were you one of the billion people who watched Apollo 8's Christmas Eve broadcast? Maybe you have other memories of the mission. Please tell us about it in the comments section. Thank you again for watching Man's Space. If you enjoyed this edition of Man's Space, please be sure to click the like button. Also, please subscribe and click the notification button to see more great videos detailing the early history of manned space travel.